welcome once again, everyone, and thanks for coming out on such a rainy day. And uh, this was a, it's a sunny at the moment, but it wasn't unloading all the gear. And uh, so, just for the record, this is uh, Goodale Conference Room uh, at St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church in Lahui, Hawaii, on February 19th. And this is, as you know, the second of the two talks on evolution and creation. And specifically today, we'll be talking about uh, the intersection of evolutionary thinking with creationism, but actually, more generally, the intersection with uh, religious thought, generally. And what I'll try to do is uh, give you a, an overview of uh, some of the main players in the contemporary debate about uh, evolution. Now, this is the one slide I'd, I'd like to mention from the last talk, uh, the issue. And as you'll recall, in 2004 and 2005, there were a whole sequence of polls taken which basically s discovered the same point, which is that well over a majority of Americans favor teaching creationism along with evolution, or they favor teaching creationism instead of evolution. And... Um, and that this extends to professional people as well as the general public. Uh, doctors in particular uh, are no different from the general public in this regard. So this is a, the, the need to discuss evolution and uh, religion and creationism in particular is very widespread and we need to do it somehow. And it's great that uh, Father Bill suggested that we host uh, a discussion of this sort here at, at church. Last week we talked about the biology side, the evolution side, and this week I'd like to talk about the religion and creationism side, and hopefully that will cover the ground. And the first thing I need to review for you is that the whole discussion of evolution and re religion has been marred, if you will, or, or characterized by litigation. And this colors the discussion a whole lot so that people don't just sort of sit down and <coughs> chat about it. And Instead, uh, there have been, there's a long history of suits. And this is the basics of it at the moment. In 1925, there, in Tennessee, there was a law called the Butler Act passed and that gave rise to the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Butler Act uh, said that, held that, it was unlawful for any teacher supported by public school funds to teach a theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible. And that very year, this was immediately challenged, and the ACLU brought suit on behalf of John Scopes, who was a teacher, and he did, in fact, uh, teach the theory of evolution. And he was found guilty, according to this statute, and fined $100. And this is a very famous trial, and he was guilty. Uh, and he, he admitted there was no contest about it. And this was a very famous trial because William Jennings Bryan, <coughs> who was a three-time presidential candidate and very famous, argued for the prosecution. And the prosecution consisted of the fundamentalist position here. And Clarence Darrow, an agnostic, uh, spoke for uh, the defense. And then this was later popularized in the movie Inherit the Wind. And uh, many people had seen that. And this was challenged, since it was a state law, it was challenged in the Tennessee Supreme Court, and the Tennessee Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional. Uh, and Scopes, however, wasn't fined, was spared the fine because of the technicality. And that's the way the matter stood until 1967. So this is recent stuff. Uh, a teacher... Uh, in Tennessee filed a class action suit because he was dismissed because he taught evolution. He was dismissed because of the Butler Act. And, but times had changed, and within three days of his filing the suit, 
uh, both houses of the Tennessee legislature uh, repealed it and it was signed into law. So this was never declared unconstitutional. Uh, it was merely repealed. However, in 1968, a year after that, uh, a case did make it to the Supreme Court. And there was an Arkansas statute, which was very similar to the Butler statute. And this made its way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court held that the US Constitution prohibits the state from requiring that teaching and learning be tailored to the principles or prohibitions of any religious set, sect or dogma. So you can't favor one religion or another. And of course, creationism was uh, an interpretation of evolution straight from Genesis, and so it represented the, the uh, endorsement of that religious perspective. Now, that then led to a, a, dev a, a device or maneuver which we're dealing with still today, that instead of teaching creation, creationists uh, tried to frame a subject called creation science and argued that this perspective as science needed to be taught adjacent to well, biological evolutionary theory because it constituted an alternative hypothesis to evolution. And so by trying to pitch uh, creation as, as creation science, um, they hoped to, uh, to, to squeeze it into the science curriculum. Now, in 1987, you see this is getting really recent, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that a Louisiana law requiring that creation science be taught in public schools along with evolution. This was in the Supreme Court. This was ruled as unconstitutional because um, it, it was interpreted as, in, as advancing a particular re religion, na namely Christi the Christian view of uh, creation. So even renaming it as creation science, it still boiled down to Genesis. And, and it held that teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origin of humankind may be validly done as long as there's a clear secular intent. So if there were a lot of alternative hypotheses about evolution that were scientific alternatives, then they definitely could and should be taught. But you can't just rename creationism as creation science and get away with it. <coughs> now, in 2005, this is just a couple years ago, um, th there was still another uh, test of this sort. Now, instead of creation science, and we'll talk about this in several slides, uh, a new formulation called intelligent design was advanced. And the hope was that intelligent design could be crafted to be sufficiently different from creation science that it would still pass muster as, as science. And, uh, and so a, in Dover, Pennsylvania, the school board required that intelligent design be um, taught in addition to evolution. And a local court, federal court, uh, ruled that even intelligent design, as the Dover School was presenting it, was still religion, and that it was still uh, illegal. And the result of this, though, is that the eight Dover School board members who voted for the intelligent design requirement were all defeated in the next election, and the new board didn't appeal the ruling. So the state of affairs at the moment is that it is illegal to teach in public schools uh, evolution uh, uh, or creationism adjacent to evolution, however you name it, creation science, intelligent design, or anything. So it's illegal to do that. Now, if you think about it, this is actually a bit of a problem because the previous slide points out that 60% of the population actually wants to have a discussion of, of creationism, however named, uh, with, with evolution. So that raises the question of where do we do this? So this can't be done, the, I mean, the will of the people is to have the discussion. So where would the discussion take place if it can't take place in schools? 
And my feeling is that this is exactly where it should take place, because this discussion can take place in private facilities, including, um, including churches and synagogues. So um, that's an interesting development, that the, that the side effect or consequence of all, these, um, of all this litigation is to force the discussion into private spaces, such as ours. Of course, we have a public-private space because we're televising this and, uh, and everything. So that's the, the history, the litigation history. But as you can tell, this then colors the discussion a whole lot. So the, the different players in, uh, on this subject have a very adversarial uh, relationship to one another. Yes, Stephanie. When you looked at 87 and 2005, did you look at the composition of the Supreme Court as making a difference in, in the way the law came down? Well, the, in 2005, uh, the, the, uh, the judge who, who weighed in on this, uh, Jones is his last name, was a conservative and is a conservative Republican appointed by uh, one of the Bushes, I believe. And uh, so it, it, the, the legality, the, the, um, so far as I can tell, the legal precedents haven't been influenced by the conservative versus liberal uh, composition of the judges. However, the the uh, proponents have you can have been classified are classifiable into either progressive or conservative. Um, but the 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 decisions don't seem to have been influenced by that uh, dichotomy. Everyone seems to agree that it's illegal to teach religion in a science class, however named. You know, and I think uh, most, not, I shouldn't say everyone, but, but at least 90% of the population thinks that. And so the question is whether creationism really is science or not. And so that, for that, you have to look in, into it in a little more detail, as we'll now do. So what I've done here for this presentation is to review who the players are in contemporary evolution debates. Now, these debates have been going back to uh, the time of Darwin and Darwin's letters with Asa Gray. And uh, so I, I don't think it's my, my interpretation of the polls is that people are not interested in a historical analysis of what Darwin's interaction was with Asa Gray and so forth. They actually want to know what's happening now. And so I have not done a historical analysis. This is an, an account of who is writing actively at this time. And, there, and here are what seem to me to be the main players. The Roman Catholic Church, and I'll go over their positions, which are, are very interesting on this matter. And then uh, these are more recent groups that, that formed since 2000, right here. And these groups all share a view of evolution which would be called theistic evolution, which is simply that um, God's, um, God creates the earth by working through the kinds of processes that science discovers, and in particular evolution. So God is making the earth through geological processes, God is making life through evolutionary <coughs> processes, and on theistic the, Theistic evolution envisions that there is a God who is running the show. And slight variants of this are those who believe that God started it and let it run uninterrupted, and others who believe that God is taking a more active role in, uh, in, in the year-by-year -year or century-by-century -century direction of events. And so the theistic evolutionists right here differ from the creationists. And the, creation, the creationists sort into two categories. The young earth creationists, who are the ones who uh, believe that the earth was created 6,000 years ago and, and insist that... Uh, that Genesis, as, as you'll see from quote shortly, that Genesis be taken exactly literally. The old earth creationists, and, and I include the intelligent design folks as old earth creationists, 
that may not be completely accurate, they may object to that, but I mean this charitably. Um, I think that the, I mean, the old, the, the intelligent design people accept an old earth, but they do have uh, some notion of special creation. So I think that they're fairly classified in here. And then there are the atheists, the new atheists, and these are a very loud group. So these are the people whose discussions are in the headlines and in the columns of the newspaper all the time. Okay, so, so I'll take you through what each one of these groups uh, has to say. And you can decide you know, uh, what your own view is uh, about them. Now, the Roman Catholic position on this uh, really begins with, in the 1950s, with an encyclical from Pope Pius XII, called Humani Generis. And it's very interesting. Teaching, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid research and discussions with regard to the doctrine of evolution, insofar as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. And so, you see, that's an endorsement about the teaching of evolution. Now, the next uh, sentence, though, says, well, we, that is the church, doesn't take a position as to... Uh, whether evolution is scientifically correct, and it has to be judged with seriousness, moderation, and so forth. So remember, this is 1950, so it's been a lot found out since then uh, in terms of the science of the matter. So they're not taking position in the science. But this is the essential distinction right here, is that evolution is, is about the material continuity of humans with other life forms, and not about the soul and the domain of the church is the soul. It's a very useful distinction and one that I personally uh, use. And, and then in 1996, this, this was um, actually strengthened by Pope John Paul II in a letter on evolution. And he says, today, almost, a hint, almost half a century after publication of the encyclical, fresh knowledge has led to the, to the recognition that evolution is more than a hypothesis and acknowledged discoveries that have led to the acceptance by researchers. Now, there was a little bit of a dust-up in 2005 when uh, Bishop, when um, the Pope uh, ben Benedict uh, came into uh, office and, and Cardinal uh, Schonborn, who's apparently a friend of the current Pope, uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times which seemed to attack evolution. And, and he has sentences like this. The argument that the whole of complexity can be explained as a mere random process is unreasonable. And he viewed evolution as being a claim that uh, life formed as a random process. Now, this is annoying, of course, to, to, to science to me, because, as you'll remember from last week, evolution is not a random process. It's only mutation that was a random process. But the direction to evolution comes from the a natural selection uh, part of the process. And so he's mistaking random mutation for the whole thing. And uh, so this is an inaccurate um, objection. And then he goes on to this, the question of the intelligent project of the cosmos naturally belongs to science. So he seems to be arguing here that, that and what was interpreted from the op-ed was that intelligent design should be taught uh, with science. And using the word intelligent right here is a kind of code for, the, at that time, for the intelligent design movement. But then when you look into it, find out what exactly does Cardinal Schonborn want taught in a science class. And what, it, what he actually wanted taught was this sentence here. The natural world is nothing less than a mediation between minds. 
the unlimited mind of the creator in our limited human minds. And you might wonder, what does that mean? <laughs> and what I take it as meaning is that if you ask yourself, why does the world exist? Why is there a world? His view is that God created the world so that God, in his mind, its mind, could reach the, our minds via the earth. We learn about God by learning about the earth. And the reason earth exists is that God put it there so that we could learn about his mind by studying the earth. Which is nice. <laughs> interesting, interesting idea. Uh, but it's not clearly science. And for those of you who are teachers, I think you can imagine looking at a science class, looking at students, and saying, I'll bet you were wondering why the earth exists, and here's why it exists. <laughs> it just, just won't work. This guy's clearly never been a teacher. And, um, and no one, I think, really thinks that does belong in a science class. It could belong in a philosophy class or a uh, theology class. There's nothing the matter with the, with the position itself. It's an, it's an, an idea. But... Um, this was the, and he was then later challenged by other Roman Catholic writers, and I think this has died away. So, so far as I can tell, at this time, the Roman Catholic position remains that enunciated by Pius the the twelfth and John Paul the second, and it's a, and a consequence of this is that all of the Roman Catholic countries, especially in Latin America, are not troubled by teaching evolution. The teaching evolution issue is primarily based in the U.S. This is where the conflict, the controversy is. And, uh, and the half of the world, which is Roman Catholic, doesn't have uh, this problem. Now, um, con on the other side altogether of the Roman Catholic position, you have uh, the new atheists. And uh, the leader of this pack is Richard Dawkins whose book in 1976 is called The Selfish Gene. And so I'll read a sequence of quotes from him. It says, our genes made us. We animals, notice the imperative tone to all of this. Our genes made us. We animals exist for their preservation and are nothing more than throwaway survival machines. The world of the selfish gene is one of savage competition, ruthless exploitation, and deceit. Now, um, Richard Dawkins is a a professor at Oxford University and is an evolutionary biologist. And the sense of this is that he's speaking for evolutionary biology. And in 1996, he then writes, he has a whole bunch of books. The universe we observe is precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And then in The Devil's Chapman, blindness is Blindness to suffering is an inherent consequence of natural selection. Nature is neither kind nor cruel, but indifferent. And Richard's writings have been, uh, he's written more books of this sort, The Blind Watchmaker right here, and this one, The God Delusion, is his most recent publication, and it's a, it's a, a flat-out attack on Christianity and religion generally. And then there are others in the pack. Uh, um, Sam Harris here, uh, Christopher Hutchins, uh, Daniel Dennett, who's a philosopher. But of these only, uh, well, actually, Harris is a, a neurobiologist. So only Dawkins and Harris are biologists. And, and the, for, the reactions of people of faith are that it is usually one of being offended by by what is very clearly an attack uh, and, and a, a, a well-articulated attack. Uh, from, from my perspective, I'm not as much upset by it because uh, people can say what they want. What I find most troubles, troublesome is that this seems to represent or is put forth as representing a consensus of what evolutionary biology says about the world. And I just... Uh, I, it's clearly inaccurate. You know, he's speaking for evolutionary biologists, evolutionary biology, when it does not, in fact, say these things. Uh, 
and there is now quite a bit of evidence for um, kindness and empathy in animals. And there's a lot of active research about how... Uh, the book right here. Someone <laughs> <laughs> wants to look at it. <laughs> there's quite a bit of research about how uh, cooperation evolves, and, uh, and it's, it's not, not entirely clear how, to, how it has evolved, but it clear, clearly has. And, and to say something like this, that nature is neither kind nor cruel but indifferent, is just not consistent with the facts. And so my objection, unlike most Christians, is actually to the science, scientific content of what they're saying. And, um, but the insulting character of it is uh, kind of by the way. So these are big players. And they write a lot of books, and they're very art, uh, and they're in a comp competition with one another for who can make the biggest insult. So it, they're, they're like frat boys sometimes, you know, it's, it's a club. Now, uh, moving right along, we then get to the intelligent design folks. So here, let me go into this in more detail. Now, the intelligent design folks um, ha have a sophisticated position. And I think of it as beginning with the, this book, Darwin on Trial, by Philip Johnson, who's, uh, who was a lawyer at Berkeley. He was a professor in the law school at Berkeley. And he wrote a book in, in which he imagined in a sense that he, he almost fantasized that he was a lawyer in the Scopes trial. Instead of William Jennings Bryan, he was doing it. And you get the idea that he would have won. Uh, and uh, uh, and he, he just wishes he had had a chance to do it. And the reason for this, and I think the New Atheists deserve some responsibility on this matter. He says, make no mistake about it. The Darwinist view, which the official view of mainstream science, God has nothing to do with evolution. Now, if you just read Dawkins and the New Atheists, you would think that this is the official view of mainstream science. And he is, after all, and Dawkins is, after all, a professor at, at, uh, at Oxford. And the, and the other atheists all have professorial positions somewhere. And I think that, if the, my personal opinion is that if the new atheists were not as uh, nasty as they are and as outspoken, that intelligent design never would have gotten going. In any case, this is what their position is. I assume... Nenosis. I assume that the creation scientists are biased by their pre-commitment to biblical fundamental, fundamentalism. I am not interested in any claims that are based on a literal reading of the Bible. Wow. Okay. So, this, from the very beginning, intelligent design is not the same as creation science. Yet, in the Dover School case, a bunch of creationists renamed creationism as intelligent design and tried to slide it into the curriculum when it was renamed. But had they bothered to read what intelligent design is, they would have immediately discovered that intelligent design is not creation science because it is clearly a rejection of biblical fundamentalism. So in some respects, the court action in the Dover case is not a finding on whether intelligent design is um, is teachable. Intelligent design sensu stricto it is teachable because uh, uh, they it had been co-opted by uh, creationists who, ha who hadn't spent the time finding out what it was actually about. And look at this too. There is no reason to doubt that peculiar circumstances can sometimes favor dark colored moths as opposed to light colored moths. Everyone agrees that microevolution occurs. Microevolution is the name for evolution in which you get something like the change from light colored moths to dark colored moths, and then back again with the smoke changing. So it's a change in the properties of a species without changing the essential form of the species. And so he's even conceding natural selection and mutation here. 
But here's where the action is. Many organs require an intricate combination of complex parts to perform their functions. How can such things be built up infinitesimally through small inherited variations, each profitable? So he's doubting that that, nat that natural selection, you know, acting on mutations, can really make an eye, or make an ear, or make a complicated organ. And, and since he doubts that they can, the, the focus of the intelligent design movement is on the special creation of organs, not of species, but of the, of the organs. <laughs> and in 2007, Michael Behe, who is, now Johnson's a lawyer, Behe is, is a biologist at Lehigh University. And he wrote a book called The Edge of Evolution that, that I reviewed for, for Christian Century. And here it says, again, evidence of common descent seems compelling. And there's also great evidence of random mutation. Compared to natural selection can modify life. And he goes on to say intelligent design is compatible with the view that the universe operates by unbroken natural laws without active continuing intervention in nature. So this, this does not sound very creationist. And, but we take as a purposeful diviner, designer, and so they never even use, they never use the word God, and, the, and that's one of their ways that they're hoping that this could qualify as science, they never use the word design, uh, God. They use the word purposeful designer. And that's where you get intelligent design. Not intelligent God, intelligent design. The purposeful designer, in a very broad sense, refers to any being, principle, or mechanism external to our universe responsible for making it probable, <laughs> probable that our universe should be fine-tuned for intelligent life. So many people have ridiculed intelligent design and saying, well, this could be a Martian, or this, yeah, this, this could be anything. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with God. And, and then he goes on at some length in that, for him, how complex does, this, does an organ have to be to be um, uh, impossible to attain through natural selection? And he says that if it takes three or more different proteins, then it's beyond... What, what he calls the edge of evolution, which is how, uh, how fast, uh, which is whether it could be realized through mutation and selection. So programs to build organs such as eyes, limbs, and body segments seem to occur in discrete modules. And elegant, these modules, elegant, coherent, functional systems upon which life depends are the result of deliberate intelligent design. So these are a lot of claims here. Now, from the science point of view, it's just very hard to check this out because it's very vague. He doesn't say, I mean, fine, all right, it, if it were true that the eye was impossible to make through natural selection, well, then how did it get made? Where was it? And so he, he's unclear, but it sounds as though when the earth was created, there, the organs were there. And, but I really don't know where the eye came from, uh, according to the intelligent design theory. There is no theory for it. And 99% of the writings from the intelligent design people amount to criticizing Darwin, and 1% at most to advancing their own view of what did happen. And if they advance their own view of what did happen, we could check it out. In the meantime, we have to deal with complaint after complaint after complaint about evolution. And it turns out, for example, that the eye is buildable through natural selection. So you take any one of these very complicated characters, and you find that the eye, for example, has evolved lots of times. The insect eye is a compound eye. It's a different looking eye than the vertebrate eye. And even the lizards that I worked on, they have what's almost a third eye because they have a photosensitive cell at the top of their head, and then they have a translucent scale over the top so that they could actually detect light like a hawk coming down on top of them. And you could easily get the evolution of, of uh, eye and see uh, that's a primitive eye. Then you could have uh, selection for a lens having, having the translucent scale. 
you know, uh, thickened and so that focuses light better. Um, and the, pro the problem is, is that the challenges to evolution are not sustained, and they have no alternative that they actually advance. So I personally, I'm one of the few scientists who's willing to agree that in principle intelligent design could be scientific. It just, they never get around to it. And, and so therefore, it can't be taught as anything other than an example of bad science, if it's science at all. Um, but these folks, these, and I think these folks are slowly but surely losing influence because the fundamentalists have slowly realized that they're not their friends. That this clear distancing from, from the Bible and Genesis and fundamentalism means that, that this isn't a helpful uh, pr uh, approach from the standpoint of uh, people who really are committed to creationism. Okay, so that's all quite recent. Uh, other recent developments are these, switching over to theistic evolution here. Evolution's, evolution Weekend, which is part of the clergy letter project started by Michael Zimmerman. I mentioned this uh, last week, and these two talks that, that I'm giving are a response to the letter about the clergy letter project that Father Bill received. And um, so this invites, this is kind of an activist organization. Uh, maybe that's too strong. It's, it's an organization that, that seeks to accumulate or, or, or organize the disparate parishes around the country that endorse evolution and faith jointly. So you can go to the Clergy Letter Project. And... Um, and here there are, in 2012, there are 12,000 or almost 13,000 clergy who have signed on to it. And there are 400 rabbis and 200 from the, uh, from the UUs, I think, uh, universal. Yeah, I, I confess I don't know what UU stands for, actually. And... Um, and here's what they have to sign on to. We, the undersigned Christian clergy, so this is not for us to uh, sign, but from different traditions believe that the timeless truths of the Bible and the discoveries of modern science may comfortably coexist. We believe that among God's good gifts are human minds capable of critical thought and that the failure to employ this gift is a rejection of the will of our creator. So that's what Father Bill was basically being uh, invited to uh, sign on to, on behalf of our congregation. And then the Biologos Forum started, and it uh, seems similar in many respects uh, in, in its philosophy. This was started by uh, evangelicals, uh, and it, it has a very professional flavor to it. It tends to bring uh, professional theologians together with uh, scientists to develop the theory of theistic evolution. But I want to talk about this especially right here. We'll get to the last two right now. Um, there is a movement that you might call ev evolutionary evangelism that's being started by Michael Dowd. And I've interacted with him and know him. And now he's, um, I haven't met him in person, but I've had a Skype call with him at some length and, and I've written for him. He's uh, a pastor and his, his approach is to explain how you feel better, you're, you're spiritually enriched by knowing about evolution. So a lot of, so when you look at the previous folks, the Biologos fo folks and the Evolution Weekend folks, it's all very intellectual. You know, and it, but Michael Dowd, on the other hand, is an impassioned uh, uh, enthusiastic and man whose enthusiasm is infectious. 
You, you can't help but just love this guy and his message. And he says things like this, religious faith and practice can positively be strengthened by what God is revealing through science. Studying evolution is like following cosmic breadcrumbs home to God. <laughs> Only by looking through evolutionary eyes can we see our way out of the global integrity crisis. And so he he looks to evolution and to science and to study and to the empirical study of the world as a source of inspiration. So it's, a, it's very different than uh, the other folks, as I say, who are very intellectual. What he did right here is he got together 38 of today's, as he puts it, most inspiring Christian leaders and developed 38 uh, interviews. And I did one of these. I don't know if I qualify as an inspiring <laughs> Christian leader, but I was honored to be included. And I listened to a lot of these while I was doing housework. I think I listened to them all um, last year. And, and people from all different uh, uh, sides or perspectives in Christianity uh, weighed in on, on how they interfaced with evolution. So uh, this... Is, and this takes an, evangel an evangelistic approach to evolution. And then finally, in terms of also uh, uh, evangelism, we have the younger earth creationists are currently being represented by a group called Answers in Genesis. And these are the folks who founded the Creation Museum, uh, which is about seven miles from the Cincinnati airport. So it's a taxi ride from the Cincinnati airport. And you see what these guys say here. They're quite out there. The account of origins presented in Genesis is a simple but factual presentation of actual events and therefore provides a reliable framework for scientific research into the question of the origin and history of life, mankind, the earth, and the universe. Okay, this is biblical literalism, big time. The various or original life forms, including mankind, were made by direct creative acts of God. The living descendants of any of the original kinds may represent more than one species today, reflecting the genetic potential within the original kind. So, on this account, there would not be one gigantic family tree that all life belongs to, but there would be several family trees, uh, one for each of the kinds. Um, and, of course, from my point of view, the problem is that isn't the case. But uh, that, that nonetheless is their, their belief. The Great Flood of Genesis was an actual historical event worldwide global extent and effect. And they try to reinterpret a lot of the geologic evidence in terms of the consequences of the Great Flood. And here's the Creation Museum. It's right off their website. So this is a state-of-the-art museum. Brings the Bible to life, casting its characters and animals in dynamic form. So Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden. Children play and dinosaurs roam near Eden's river. The serpent coils cunningly. This is right off their website. And here's a picture of it. So here they have he, a child with living with a dinosaur in the Garden of Eden. And it's interesting right here. This is a Tyrannosaurus rex. This is eating leaves. <laughs> now, why would a Tyrannosaurus rex eat leaves? Because this is before the fall of Adam, and the fall of Adam is when death and suffering began. So therefore, the dinosaur has to be a vegetarian, even though the Tyrannosaurus rex is clearly a, a carnivore. So, um, and that child is cloned. Yeah, the child is closed. <laughs> I hope you realize that there are a whole lot of people um,
going to this museum, their narrative is clearly satisfying the spiritual needs of a great many people. And one wonders why, and whether these people are well informed as to whether their spiritual needs could, could have been satisfied, for example, by the, um, by the ministry of Michael Dowd. Uh, or are these folks merely <laughs> reacting to the negativity of the new atheists? Um, I don't know. Uh, but in some sense, in, in my view, and I'll just say it, I, I think it's tragic because this, this is wrong, <coughs> this is incorrect both in its science and in the insistence on the literal interpretation of Genesis. I, uh, it seems to me quite clear that uh, Jesus' teaching directly argues against literalism. It's Jesus who criticizes uh, the teachings of uh, in Leviticus and in other places. Uh, and it's uh, and so I, I think if Jesus were alive today, he would be a biblical literalist and would not qualify as that. So but these folks are um, big players. And this then is the array of uh, uh, proponents of one side or another currently active in the evolution debates. So my final slide is to just mention some recommended readings. For biology, um, Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True, is useful in, go in reviewing the evidence for evolution. He's, he's very much uh, uh, a defender of evolution, though, so that you don't get from Jerry any acknowledgement of where evolutionary biology is inadequate and needs more work, which I think is a, a serious problem for Jerry. Sean Carroll is someone who writes about how the organism can develop complicated characteristics. And so this has to do with the developmental biology of, uh, of, of organisms. Then I've already mentioned Michael Dowd for evolutionary spirituality. We have Michael Dowd, thank God for evolution. And Francis Collins, who's the person who started the BioLogos Foundation. He's, his book, The Language of God, has been very important to people. He's an evangelist, he was originally an atheist, and, and turned to God on the basis of his encounter with nature. And many people have found this a very inspiring book. And then I have to, of course, give you a uh, <laughs> plug for my Love own book, <laughs> Evolution and Christian Faith, which you've seen. And my most recent book is called The Genial Gene. And uh, it's a clear counterpoint to Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. And uh, mm -hmm. talks about the evolution, <laughs> the evolution of cooperation and, and so forth. So there we are. Um, hopefully that gives you an overview of uh, the way uh, evolutionary biology and Creationism and religion intersected. So, so. <laughs>